So we are in this series called How You Feeling, and we're talking about our feelings and we're talking about our emotions. How you feel about that depends largely upon things like um, birth order, gender, generation, all those things come into play. Some of us tend toward, to be towards uh, emotional avoidance. We don't want to talk about our feelings. We, we, would, we would just prefer to act like that's not part of who we are. But there's a direct correlation between emotional avoidance and, and the way you vacillate between things like apathy and anger. And some of us, it's more emotional indulgence. We just want to feel our feelings. And we want feelings to be the GPS for our lives that direct us and, and everything is decided based on how we feel about it. And, and what we want to do in this series is get a biblical understanding of how we are to manage our emotions and how we deal with what we feel. And so last week we said that every emotion is like a vehicle, that it, it's going to take us in one direction or another. We used a, a sign, a road sign that, that splits, that every time you feel this emotion, it's going to move you. It's going to take you in a direction. Now the question is, what direction will it take you? See, a lot of us were taught when it came to our emotions, there was just a right way to feel and a wrong way to feel. And if you feel the wrong way, stop feeling the wrong way and start feeling the right way. It doesn't work very well. And biblically, what we understand is that God wants to do for our, emotion, our emotions what he, he wants to do for our thoughts and for our lives. He wants to redeem them. And whenever we have this feeling or this emotion, it's an opportunity for us to invite God in and let him take us in a different direction, a new direction. And so in, in this morning, we're going to be talking about the emotion of shame, the emotion of shame. The question is, where will that emotion lead you? Will it take you down a path of isolation and hiddenness and secrecy? Or will it lead you to a place of grace, a place of freedom, a place of deeper community and connection? Every time you have this emotion, this feeling, it's an opportunity to invite God into the vehicle and to say, God, where do you want this to take me? And it'll either take you closer to him and who he wants you to be, or it'll take you away. So I was trying to think of what kind of vehicle would be the right vehicle to capture shame. And what came to my mind was my 1995 Chevy Venture minivan. This, <laughs> this is the vehicle of shame. This is, this is what shame looks like in vehicle form. It is a 95 Chevy Venture minivan. That's, that's what shame looks like. And I can tell you, driving this minivan with four young kids, it, it didn't have any extra features, but I spent some money on one, one extra, and it was heavy window tending on the driver's side. Like, I, I didn't want anyone to know I was driving it. And so I pretty much blacked out that window so you couldn't see, but I still sat low when I drove. And, and I can tell you this about the minivan of shame. It would take me to the corner of the parking lot where nobody else would park. And that's, that's where I would park it. And the minivan of shame wanted to make sure that the people around me never saw me in it. And when I would pull up to a, a, a stoplight, I, I would pretend to be on my phone just in case the person next to me might be someone I know and might see me driving the minivan of shame. The minivan of shame did not want to be seen. The minivan of shame liked isolation. It wanted to be hidden. It liked dark places. If somebody asked me during that time what kind of car that I, would, that I drove, I didn't want to lie. So I would say, I don't want to talk about it. And I didn't. I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to talk about the minivan of shame that I drove. And this is, this is what shame tends to do for most of us. It's a vehicle that leads us towards hiddenness and secrecy and silence. And we just, we just don't want to talk about it. And that's how shame has been since the beginning. So we first read about shame in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sin. Sin comes on the scene. They feel shame. What's the first thing they do? They cover themselves. We tend to think about the fact that they hid from God, which is true, but they, they first hid from each other. And so we read about husband and wife being naked and unashamed, but then there's shame and they they are ashamed, and so they cover themselves, and, and this is the reason why, is that because shame destroys intimacy. Shame destroys intimacy. So where you have secrets and you have silence, you do not have intimacy. Where you're withholding things, where you keep things in the dark, where there's parts of you that, that nobody knows about, you have isolation, but you don't have intimacy, and it's killing some of you. 
It, it destroys intimacy between one another, but it also destroys intimacy between us and God. And so we see that with Adam and Eve, they, they hide from God. And, and so what we wanna do in the next few minutes is we wanna read a psalm together. Psalm 32, and David talks about how he deals with shame. He talks about what it was like to live with shame and then what it was like when he was set free from shame. Uh, the context of the psalm, it, it ties directly to 2 Samuel 11 where we read about David having an affair with Bathsheba. You probably know the story at least a little bit, but David goes up onto the rooftop of his palace late in the evening and he looks down and the Bible says he sees a beautiful woman bathing on her rooftop as was the custom. Now, I, I'm guessing that David knew what he was gonna see when he went up on his rooftop. I'm guessing this isn't the first time he had logged onto that website. I'm guessing he, he knew what he was gonna find. So he looks down, he sees Bathsheba. He says to his servants, who is that? They say, that's Bathsheba. But they don't just say her name, they say, that's Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. David knows Uriah. It's one, one of his fighting men. David had shed blood with Uriah, had been on the battlefield with Uriah. That's, David, that's his wife. That's who that is. Why don't, you, why don't you go get her for me? I don't know what he's thinking at this point. Maybe he thinks he's stronger than he really is. Maybe he's telling himself, well, I just want to, I just want to meet her. I just want to check in on her. Just want to make sure things are going okay for her. I'm not gonna let things go too far. I don't, I don't know what he was telling himself, but you know the story. And David has this affair with Bathsheba. He convinces himself no one's gonna find out. And, and yet, a few weeks later, Bathsheba, he receives news, is, is pregnant. And Uriah has been at war for months. And so to try to cover things up, David brings Uriah back from the battlefield thinking that he would sleep with his wife and, and he and all the other people in the community would just believe that that's Uriah's baby. So Uriah comes home, but he doesn't sleep in bed with his wife. He wasn't gonna do that while he has fellow soldiers spilling blood on the battlefield. He's not gonna sleep in bed with his beautiful wife while his brothers are out there suffering. And so he sleeps on a mat with the servants and David's plan doesn't work. And so he sends Uriah back to the battlefield with this um, confidential letter that Uriah is to give to Joab, the commander. And the letter says, Joab, I want you to put Uriah at the front line where the battle is the fiercest and then I want you to withdraw from him. And so Uriah is killed. David brings Bathsheba into the palace, makes her one of his wives more than a year passes. It looks like, it looks like he's kind of gotten away with it, but he's gonna to talk to us about the weight of shame that he has been carrying and the effect that it has had on his life. It, it seemed that nobody found out. It might have looked like nobody knew, but there was one who, who knew. And the Bible says he was not happy. God was not happy with David. And so God sends the prophet Nathan to confront David. We'll look at that part of the story in a moment. But when David is confronted with his sin, he confesses and he comes clean, he repents, and now he writes to us about this in Psalm 32, what it was like to live in shame and what it's like to be set free from it. Psalm 32, starting in verse one. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and whose spirit there is no deceit. And he talks to us here about emotions. You wanna be happy? Here's what happiness looks like. It's being forgiven. Being forgiven of your sin. That's what it looks like to be happy. If you wanna be happy, it, it, it looks like bringing what's in the darkness out into the light so that in your spirit there is no deceit. And he uses the word transgression here, it's a strong sin word. It's this idea of a crime. It's this idea of initially stepping over a known boundary. So don't miss this because it's significant. David, when he talks to us about shame, he begins by telling us about his sin. He doesn't say slip up, he says sin. He doesn't say indiscretion, he says transgression. Strong language. I know when you talk about shame, it could be pretty nuanced. I mean, there's all kinds of shame. You could be 
feeling shame because not, of some, not because of something you did, but something that was done to you, you could feel shame. You could feel shame because of words that were spoken over you, or someone shamed you, made you think that this part of your identity was inevitable. You've heard some of that maybe as a child and you've continued to feel the shame of it, but David is speaking just really clearly about shame based on something he has done in the past and he, he just calls it what it is. He says it was a sin, it was a transgression and, and this language matters. I, I was uh, reading in, uh, about this, how in the Oxford Junior Dictionary, how they removed the word sin from the dictionary and the explanation was, quote, that it had fallen into disuse and was no longer relevant to younger generations. And, and there's a sense in which that's true, that we, we don't talk about sin very often because we think this is how we deal with shame. We don't want people to feel shame, so let's just make, make things not a big deal. Let's just minimize our sin. Let's, in fact, let's not even use the word. And maybe if we don't call it sin, maybe if we don't call it transgression, we'll stop feeling shame. Maybe if we just say it's not that big of a deal, then it won't be that big of a deal. But how's that worked for us? And so we try to cover up our shame by minimizing the seriousness of the mistakes we've made, the sins we've committed, but being set free and finding happiness, it begins by, by calling a sin a sin. And so that means you're not gonna call it an accident or a blunder or an oversight or a slip up or a trip up or a misstep or a misunderstanding or a lapse in judgment, it's sin. After his affair with Bathsheba, more than a year passes and David refused to acknowledge his sin. Um, he just kept trying to hide it. He, as we saw, he hid it by trying to have Uriah killed, or he did have Uriah killed. I want you to notice what he's doing. He's, he's thinking that he can deal with the shame by destroying the evidence, and as long as nobody finds out, he'll be fine. So he, he tries to destroy the evidence. He thinks that the worst thing that can happen is for somebody to find out what he's done. That's not the worst thing that can happen. The worst thing that can happen is not for somebody to find out your secret. It's that you make it through your whole life and you keep your secret and you die a respectable fraud and you miss out on the joy and the freedom that Jesus offers. That's the worst thing that can happen. And, and so David tries to hide it, but how's he hide it? He hides his shame by doing something shameful. He hides his affair by committing murder. And this is a... A strange thing that, that shame, if we keep it hidden, it will drive us deeper into shame, that we will, we will hide our shame, we will try to deal with our shame by doing shameful things. But we're just so concerned. You know, what if people find out? What if somebody knows? And, and shame doesn't care if anyone else knows as long as you know. And, and so David describes what it was like to have this weight on him. He says in verse three, when I kept silent, when I lived with my secrets, when nobody knew and I thought I was getting away with it, my bones wasted away through groaning all day long. I wasn't getting away with anything. And for day and night, David says your, to God, your hand was heavy on me and my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. That he's living with this shame and it's just, it's isolating him from God. He feels the, the weight of God's hand on him, and so now he's, he's living his life disconnected from God, doesn't, doesn't want to have anything to do with God because there's this wall between him and God that needs to be dealt with. It's shame, it disconnects you, it isolates you from, from God and from other people. Uh, when, when I was in high school, I would sometimes eat at this restaurant called Garfield's. Y'all remember Garfield's, anybody? have a Garfield's like in their shopping mall. Yeah, it was uh, like an Applebee's. And they had a sandwich there called a Monte Cristo sandwich. You know what that is? Okay. It's like a deep fried ham and cheese sandwich with powdered sugar that you dip in honey. It's, it's good and good for you. And so I loved a good Monte Cristo sandwich and, and I was eating by myself at Garfield's, gonna meet some friends afterwards at a movie theater in the mall there and the check came and I didn't have my wallet with me, I didn't have any money. I didn't realize that and, and until it was too late, but I didn't know what to do about it. Like these are the, this was the days before people had cell phones, I couldn't call anybody. 
and asked them to come help me out. I didn't have a cell phone, I did have a pager, a beeper. You remember those? It's like for doctors and cool kids. And, and the, the, the people would call your pager and a number would come up and it would let you know you have to go to the pay phone to call the number. Is that a pager? You know, probably a Sony Discman, uh, probably a Swatch Watch, maybe something from Spencer's Gifts when I snuck in there. Uh, that, was the, that was the time in my life. And, and so I, I'm, sitting at this, uh, I'm sitting at this restaurant trying to figure out what to do. And I don't have, I don't have the money, and so I, I just make this decision that I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ditch the check. I'm, I'm just going to get up and walk out. And so, you know, I pretended like I had to get to the hospital stat. And I, I got out of there, and, um, and for the next five years, I never ate at Garfield's again. It was one of my favorite places, but I couldn't go there anymore because of what had happened. And I thought, well, Kyle, you need to go back and pay the check. I mean, it wasn't intentional. It just happened. And you, you need, but it was embarrassing to go back and, and say that you know, I just left because I knew it was wrong. And, and so I, you know, I never did it. My friends would go eat there, and I would come up with some excuse. They'd eat by the, I, I wouldn't eat with them. My grandmother, I remember she lived right around the corner. She had a, a little birthday lunch there, and I... I lied and said I wasn't feeling good because I didn't want to go eat at Garfield's with my grandma and being rested in the middle of her birthday. Like, that was not <laughs> the scene I wanted to see unfold. And so that's kind of how it went. For five years, I just avoided that place and the people that would go there. And, and then I thought, well, I, I need to, I had moved out of town, but I was still thinking about it from time to time. I thought, I just need to make it right and be done with this. And so I figured up the interest, and the next time I was in town, I went to Garfield's, and I was going to pay for the meal. But it was closed. And I'm like, is that my fault? Is it? <laughs> like, is, now I feel even more shame. And, and I think what happened with me and Garfield's and people there, I, I think that explains why some of you really don't want to be in church on the weekend. Like you, you don't really like being here because it just kind of reminds you of these things that you haven't dealt with or, or some sins that you've committed and you don't really want anybody to talk to you about it. You'd much rather be around people and environments where those things aren't a big deal and nobody takes it seriously and so you, you tend to avoid places like this and people like me and maybe some of the people around you and, and David, David had isolated himself from God, from others, and, and he was feeling the physical effects. He says his strength was sapped as in the heat of summer, but there was, there's also relational effects. It's, it starts to, um, shame just starts to impact your relationships. So a, a few questions to think through. Have you been avoiding certain people in your life? Are there certain people that you just steer clear of because you're ashamed of something you did and you don't want to be reminded of it. I've talked to parents who are ashamed of their divorce so they avoid their children. I've, I've talked to people who are ashamed of failure and so they, they, avoid, the, they avoid the people who remind them of, of their failure and so it ends up being that the, the people you should be embracing, the people who should give you joy and energy, you avoid because of shame. And so the vehicle of shame has just driven you into the corner of the parking lot away from everybody else. Another question is, have you been defensive lately? I, I don't wanna talk about it, approach to life. It, you know, it, makes us more, it makes us more defensive. We know there's something that needs to be dealt with and until we deal with it, we tend to be a little bit more on edge. Uh, likewise, here's a question. Of, do you have a tendency to be critical of others? One of the ways we deal with shame is with blame. We deal with shame by playing the blame game. That's, that's what a lot of us do. We, we deal with our own shame by pointing the finger at somebody else. Like some of you are pro level at this. Like you can reverse engineer all the problems in your life and blame other people for it and it somehow lets you feel like you're off the hook and you try to hide your shame that way. Nathan confronts David about his sin he does it by telling this parable, telling a little story. It's not real. He says to David, hey, uh, David, there's, David doesn't know it's not real, but David, there's this wealthy man in the kingdom. He's got all kinds of sheep, but his poor neighbor only had one sheep, and the wealthy guy stole the poor man's sheep and put that on the barbecue for his friends and family. What do we do to the rich guy? 
And David says, put him to death. And Nathan says, you are that guy. It wasn't a sheep, but it was another man's wife. David, you're the man. And David is immediately overcome with repentance and confession. And he grieves his sin and what he had done. He begins to own it. It's interesting, though, to me that initially he was pretty harsh with the guy in the story who stole the one sheep, even though what he had done is much worse. This is an interesting thing about shame, and some of you experience this in your religious circles growing up, that people sometimes deal with shame by shaming people around them. They deal with their own shame by putting shame on people around them who, frankly, may not be as guilty as they are. And so we try to hide our shame behind somebody else's shame. And if I make your shame bigger than my shame, then maybe no, nobody will notice my shame. And so David is, is critical and harsh, but then he's confronted with his own sin and he confesses. Verse five, he says, then I acknowledged my sin to you. And I didn't cover it up anymore. I didn't cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. And this is what you do. Some of you feel shame. The message is not stop feeling that way. The message is confess. You bring what's in the dark out into the light. David goes from not talking about it to acknowledging it. He goes from suppressing it to confessing it. That is not easy to do, but that is where freedom is found. That is where, that is where healing is discovered. Where you recognize, as we said last week, that God can't heal what I refuse to reveal. And when I reveal it, when I bring it out into the light, it gives opportunity for God to bring healing. And he says in verse five to God, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. This is really significant. He doesn't just say you forgave my sin. He says you forgave, forgave the guilt of my sin. Now listen. Some of you grew up in church where you were taught that Jesus forgave your sin, but what got skipped over was that he also forgives the guilt of your sin. See, some of you were taught Jesus forgives your sin, but you still need to feel bad about it for the rest of your life. And then that was used as a way to control. It was used as a way to exert power, but that is not the gospel. The gospel isn't just that Jesus forgives your sin, but that he forgives the guilt of your sin. Jesus didn't just take your sin upon himself, he took your shame upon himself. And this makes all the difference in how we feel set free. Jesus didn't just forgive what you did. He forgave your guilt, he forgave your shame. And when we make it anything less than that, we we water down the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And, and so let's just be really clear about that here. Jesus forgives your sins. He gives grace to what you did wrong, but he also, he also takes your guilt. He also takes your shame. He, he wants to, to take your emotions and your feelings. He didn't just die for your sin. He died for your feelings, your emotions, so that you could be free from that weight. And so David speaks of that. And he says that God forgave him, and the word forgive here is to lift a heavy burden and carry it away. God wants to do that for some of you right now, right now, to remove it from sight. And then if you look down in verse 11, it says, rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous, sing all you who are upright in heart. That this is where joy comes. And so the vehicle of shame, it can take you to a place of isolation or it can take you to a place of intimacy. It, it can take you to a place of darkness or it can take you to a place of light where there is healing. And so some of you, I mean, if you rolled in here in a 95 Chevy Venture van and you are in the minivan of shame, you may think that you gotta keep it in the back parking lot, nobody wants to see that. And Jesus, Jesus says, I'll, I'll ride in that. I'll roll that way. I'll drive, I'll drive your 95 Chevy Venture minivan of shame. And he'll drive it to the cross where you can find freedom and you can find grace. 
There's one little verse that I wanna end with. It's in verse six, it's right in the middle of it. David says, therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. There's a sense in which when you're dealing with shame, your time is limited because shame will drown you in secrets and silence. Shame will harden your heart. It'll isolate you so much that, that you stop seeing. And so David says, may they find you while you may be found. And so that's what we wanna do here in the next few minutes. We wanna roll up in our minivans of shame and we wanna invite Jesus in and we wanna let him take us to a place of freedom, a place of forgiveness, and a place of grace. Let's pray. God, I, I know that this is not easy because what we're talking about is, is sharing secrets. We're talking about taking something that is in the dark and bringing it into the light. And I know for some people in this room, it, this is their worst fear. But God, I, I pray that they would see that this is where freedom is found. Would you give them 20 seconds of courage to confess to you and to confess to maybe a, a, a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ? They don't have to tell everybody, but they need to tell somebody. And so I, I pray, God, that you would allow us to leave here with the freedom that David expresses in Psalm 32, that we would find, we would find joy when we confess. And so, Jesus, would you just let us know that this is, this is safe, that you already know that you love us right where we are, but you don't wanna leave us that way. Would you help us find the courage by the power of your Holy Spirit to confess, to come clean, and discover grace. It's in your name we pray, amen.